So chapter 25 of Matthew is where we find ourselves tonight. And I would like to uh, begin by reframing kind of what we talked about last week. Um, we have the video, so you can go back and revisit last week and try and get that. But really what I did is I, I kind of introduced a different paradigm last week. Um, moderns read this section of scripture um, differently, a lot of different ways, but um, they have something in, in, in common is that they, they try and parse it into different answers that Jesus is giving that apply to different ages. What do I mean by that? Um, it all goes back to that question in Matthew 24, 3, when they come out of the Temple Mount, right? And uh, they are commenting on the beautiful buildings and Jesus says, those are all gonna be destroyed. And in Matthew, it says, tell us when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And modern people have taken those, that statement, that one sentence, and every time there's an and, a comma and an and in the English, they have tried to parse that out into three different questions, or sometimes the last two are one question and the first one is one question. And they try and take Jesus' answer and apply it to happening at different times, sometimes within the generation of the disciples and sometimes yet future generation to us hasn't happened yet, okay? That's very common. Last week though, I introduced an idea that we can read chapters 23, 24, and 25, what I think is this last discourse in its entirety. We can read it with the perspective or the paradigm of the question was really a question about what was happening, when are those temple buildings going to destroy, be destroyed and everything that goes with that event. And we can also read Jesus' answer that way as well. And some of you I know are not convinced by that out of just last week's uh, wonderful PowerPoint that I provided. So I'm gonna try and build some uh, logic just by showing how I've gotten to where my perspective is. Last week I briefly mentioned in Luke the original or the similar account in Luke in chapter 21 verses 5 through 7 it records the disciples question is this teacher therefore when will these things happen that sounds a lot like Matthew's the first part of Matthew's a question but then Luke says not about your coming or the end of the age he takes that and he gives the the Gentile equivalent of it, because Luke's writing to a Gentile audience, and it says, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Luke lumps them all together, and because Luke says it that way, we can go to Matthew and understand what looks to be a three-part question to be really a question in Jewish terminology, I'll point out later, but it's, a, it's one question. It's a question that they expected all to happen. They're not asking two different questions. When will the temple be destroyed? And that yet future that we will never see, end of age, what will that look like? That's not what the disciples are asking, okay? They're asking one question. Luke helps us with that. If that doesn't convince you, let me go to Mark, a Jewish author. And in Mark's gospel, the other synoptic, he records the question this way, and I think it's, it's got something that we need to pay attention to. Mark says, tell us, when will these things be? Sounds familiar. And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Mark mirrors Luke in the way he presents it. He takes out the coming language, your coming. He takes out the end of age language that Matthew includes. I'm not saying the disciples didn't say those words. I'm just saying, I think Luke and Mark get to the meaning behind the question in the way they phrase it. Uh, some, a Jewish person reading Matthew would have understood what they were asking. We're not Jewish people in their context, and we've come up with different ways of reading it. Okay? So, how do I know that really Mark and Luke or the way we should understand it? Well, if you just go down a little bit in Mark, so the question is in Mark 1 through 4, 
when will these things be and what will be the signs when all these things are going to be fulfilled? If you go down to Mark 13, 30, same chapter, in Jesus' answer, it's a shortened version of the one Matthew presents. Jesus says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, I don't know if you've caught it, but there's a verbal similarity between the question and the answer. The question is, when will all these things, when are they going to be fulfilled? And Jesus says, all these things will happen within this generation. The temple will be destroyed. The fulfillment of Jesus coming into his kingdom as presented in Daniel chapter seven will be fulfilled. You'll see the ramifications of that here on earth and you will witness the end of an age. What age are they talking about? Are they talking about the age, the end of the church age? That's the way we read it. No, they didn't know the church age was even going to exist. It wasn't on their radar. They're asking the end of the age that we're currently in, the disciples age, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant age, where the temple and the temple leadership and sacrifices were being offered at the temple. When is the end of that age? And Jesus, as Messiah, you've been born. When are you coming in your kingdom and setting up a new age? That was their question. Okay? I think the text shows us that that's the best way to read it. But is that the way we've read it? It's not the way I've read it for the majority of my life. So I'm not trying to point a finger because you know what happens. You get three right back at you. So I'm right there with you. I've read this one way. I've been taught to read this one way. That part of this at least applies, if not most of it applies, to something yet future to us. I'm going to challenge that thinking again tonight as we dive into the next. So before we get into this chapter, chapter 25, though, let's just look at the options about this question. Let's go through the logic of this question that the disciples ask at the beginning of Matthew 24. What, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of the age? There's three options that I can see. There may be more, but these are the three biggest ones. First option they were really asking a question about one thing and Jesus knew it was much more complicated than that and part of it was going to be here and part of it was yet future to us and okay so let's assume that that's one option but the the really the first option is this Jesus didn't understand the question they were asking is it possible that they asked the question that Jesus just didn't understand they, he didn't understand what they were asking, and so his response may have gone awry. It's not, it's not an option, right? He knew. Okay, so we get rid of option number one pretty quickly. Number two is the one I started with that kind of fits uh, most modern readings, that Jesus understood their question. It was a question about what was going to happen at one time within their lifetime, the destruction of the temple and all those things that go with that. But Jesus recognized their question as an incorrect question because they didn't understand the full implications of it. And Jesus answered a different question. He didn't answer the one they asked, but he answered, he gave the answer to what moderns view is the correct answer to the correct question. But in doing so, he didn't tell anybody that he was talking to that that's what he was doing. He didn't mention, you guys are understanding this incorrectly. And so I'm going to answer this in two parts. And part of this is going to answer the question you asked. But because you don't understand it fully, I'm going to answer another part that replies to a different part of the answer that people in, right? Not only did he not do that for his listeners, but when he gave his answer, I'm going to suggest to you by looking at some of his responses, I'm going to just suggest to you that he answered it pretty straightforwardly. Okay, we haven't read it that way in modern times, but this is the third option, that Jesus actually understood the question that they were asking, and he answered it. And we didn't understand the question when we read it. 
and we tried to parse Jesus' answer out. Now, some of you are feeling very uncomfortable right now and thinking, what's going on with my basis, with my understanding, with my... And I would just say, let's read the text, okay? And we can always go to our commentaries later and consult what other people have opinions, okay? Lots of different opinions on this, so I'm not saying this is the only one. I just want to present, what does the text say, and what's the most straightforward way that we can read the text? Okay? So, one last thing to consider. These events happened on a, at a point in time in the last week of Jesus' life before his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. That's when they happened. That's when they originally asked their question. That's when Jesus answered their question. When did this get written down, though? Do you have any idea? They had this conversation. They didn't write it down that night, okay? Busy week. Understandable, right? Didn't get to their case notes or whatever they needed to do to write down the stuff. So the events of that week happened. Jesus was just two days later handed over, right? Crucified, in the grave, resurrected. Oh my, oh my word, right? Ascended to heaven. Pentecost came and went. Lots of stuff happening. They, they're in a verbal society, not a lot of writing down uh, anyway. They tell this story of this conversation that they had for about 30 years. And near the end of their life, not yet at the end of the generation, before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD though, they write down their gospel accounts. And when they write down their gospel accounts, what do they do? You would suspect if they had asked a wrong question, that Jesus' answer didn't bring to light after his death, burial, resurrection, maybe he would have mentioned uh, that conversation we had a few days ago. This is how I answered it and this is what it means. And maybe they would have then understood. But 30 years later, they present to you in their gospels the original question they asked as if it's a correct question and Jesus's original response without any commentary to once he said this or once he was risen from the dead we fully understood what he meant and this is how but they do that in other places uh, if you remember in John chapter 2 Jesus makes a uh, comment about the destruction of the temple the temple cleansing in John is in chapter 2 it's early and uh, they say, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things, for cleansing the temple? And Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now watch what happens after this. The red letters go away. The Jews then took it, uh, it took, said it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it in three days. 21's commentary, though, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. When did they figure that out? 22 lets us in. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture that they connected all the dots after this, oh, this made sense. And they let you know that that had happened. We don't see anything like this in Matthew chapter 24 or 25's conversation about that question about Jesus's response. I suspect that 30 years later, after having all the disciples tell this story multiple times over 30 years in a verbal society. Had it been a wrong question, had Jesus' answer needed to be parsed out, I think they would have come to that conclusion and they would have presented it that way. But that's not what we find. Just one more reason why maybe we could read this section that way. How do we know that Jesus, uh, when he answered the question, how do we know that he wasn't referring to other things? So, for instance, what was, what was Jesus saying in his answer? First, he was saying these things. When are these, things these temple buildings, when are they going to be destroyed? He gave that answer. The destruction of the temple is going to happen within a generation. We know that that part, that's history. We know that happened happen within the 40 year general time period that a generation would be. Not only would predict the downfall of the temple structures, but also 
the ministry that the temple allowed to happen, right? Number two, the destruction of the temple in Jesus' answer, I believe this is what he was saying. It's going to be the end of an age. It's going to be the end of that system where people bring sacrifices to a priest in a temple in Jerusalem. And people will still be able to worship the one true God, but it won't be in Jerusalem or on any other mountain, but they'll worship him in spirit and in truth. Does this sound familiar at all? It, sound, it reminds me of a conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman at a well in John chapter 4. I'm so excited to get to the book of John next. <laughs> right? What does that conversation look like? John chapter 4, verse 19. The woman said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. A lot of stuff happened before this. You can read it. And then she says, our fathers, our Samaritan fathers, who have some Jewish history, but then they intermarried and they kind of went wonky with their theology, okay? Our fathers worship on this mountain, one that they were close to, and you people who, you Jewish people, you purebreds, right? You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. And Jesus' answer is telling. He says, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither this mountain, the one next to them, nor the mountain in Jerusalem, that's not where you're going to be worshiping the Father. But, what does he say? You worship what you do not know. We Jews worship what we do know. They have some history with this uh, Father that they're talking about. For salvation is from these people and their understanding and the scripture that was handed down through them. But an hour is coming. And now is not just for us, but for the woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4, the time was then, what time? When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Not at this mountain or at that mountain. That age is ending. And a new age, not is going to begin, but what does it say? has already begun. True worshipers in this transitional generation, once Jesus shows up and starts presenting himself as Messiah, can come to faith in him, and true worshipers that were a part of the Old Testament system could transfer their faith to Jesus and start worshiping not at a mountain, but in spirit and in truth, and still be worshiping the Father, the same Yahweh of the Old Testament. But, that temple would stick around for a generation. We talked about that last week a little bit. And so true worshipers would also be attending temple and worshiping in that system until the destruction of that temple. And both were going to be valid until that generation and the temple was destroyed. How do I know that? This almost sounds heretical, right? Almost. But think, this is a unique generation to any other generation that ever existed ever before where they had true believers in a promise and then they met their Messiah. It's not true of our generation. It was true, not true of any generation prior to that one. So you would expect that generation to be unique of any other generation, worshiping in spirit and in truth. It's the true end of an age and the beginning of a brand new age one that we're currently in, okay? Uh, what's the context of the coming of the Son of Man? He's, he's just saying, you've read your Daniel 7 passage. You understand that Daniel 7 says this character, the Son of Man, is going to be seated and given all dominion and authority. You'll see the ramifications of that within this generation. How? This temple will be destroyed and a new age will fully be enveloped. Does that make sense? Again, whether you agree with it or not, I'll give you some time to think. Give you time to go back and watch the video again. That's all good. So, hey, how about if we get to Matthew 25? Would that, <laughs> would that be appropriate tonight? Okay, Matthew chapter 25. Now, if you remember the outline that I presented a few weeks ago, my suggestion is that chapters 23, the woes to the Pharisees, chapter 24, what we covered last week, and chapter 25 are all part of one discourse. 
if I'm wrong and everybody else is right, then it's just chapter 24 and 25 that's part of this last discourse, okay? But I think thematically they all go together, so uh, I'm willing to stick my neck out there. Um, all that said, chapter 25, if it's part of the same discourse that was in chapter 24 and everybody agrees on that, you would expect that the subject of what's happening in chapter five and what's discussed in chapter 25 is similar to chapter 24. Now if this, both of these chapters or all three of these chapters are discussing that generation, things that would happen in that generation, the destruction of the temple, the ending of that age, and the coming of the Son of Man like Daniel 7 predicted, you would expect these three parables in chapter 25 to speak to that circumstance. And my guess is that the way you've read it historically, because this is the way I have read it most of my life, is that these parables really apply to something yet future to us or events that have not yet happened. But if chapter 24 is talking about past events and chapter 25 is part of the same discourse, you would expect Jesus to do some teaching and then repeat that teaching in parable form to back it up. Let's dive in and see. I'm not going to go into great detail with any of these because you've spent time in them, so you're familiar with what is in the parables. But in these parables, if it does represent people that were alive in Jesus or situations that were alive in Jesus' generation, you would expect characters in these parables to kind of take two different forms. A good form where they have good characters and a bad form where there is bad things happening and bad characters, okay? You would expect that. If it was representing uh, archetypes in Jesus' day, who would the bad forms be? Bad characters? They would be the religious leaders of the day. We've seen this throughout Matthew, have we not? Okay? To think that Jesus changes his method of teaching here right at the end isn't consistent with the rest of Matthew, what we've seen. Throughout, we've seen parables. The parables usually have a bad character. Those bad characters are always the leadership. Good characters, who would they be? People that hear Jesus' words, listen to his words, are able to hear his words, believe in him, and follow his words in faith, and obey what he's teaching. Good characters. Exactly what the religious leaders are not doing, right? Okay. You would expect, in these parables, if that's the case, you would expect that to be the case for these three as well. So let's dive into the uh, parable of the ten virgins in chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. How many different groups do we have? Well, there's ten virgins, right? But that's not the groups. How many? We got two groups, right? We got five and five, clearly. Five that are prepared with oil in their lamps, even though they seem to have fallen asleep and dozed off. And five that are not prepared because they do not have oil in their lamps. And when the bridegroom comes and calls them into the wedding feast, they're not ready to go in and they're not allowed in. The five that don't have the oil, who might they be if, if this reading is correct? Who might they represent? The religious leaders of the day, the five virgins that have oil. They might represent the people that have listened to Jesus' words and obeyed them, right? Um, they're presented as this, foolish and prudent. That's the NASB. What other versions do you have and how are they described in verse two? Foolish is pretty common, I think. Wise, prudent, and wise, same. Same, uh, uh, one Greek word can be translated both ways, that's, that's fine. Back in Matthew chapter seven, we see the same word pop up. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a prudent or a wise man who built his house on the rock of Jesus and his teachings. How do you build your house in this case? You obey what he says to do, and those actions are building a house, a spiritual house, right? Okay, telling other people about the word, actually doing good deeds, okay? That's building the house. 
So in Matthew chapter 7, the same words used of a person that hears the words of Jesus and acts on them. So let's go back, see if this applies. Five of them were foolish, heard the words of Jesus and didn't act on them, didn't start building that house on the foundation of Jesus, right? But the foolish people here that didn't put oil in their lamps, built their houses on different foundations, right? And then you've got five that are prudent or wise, and they are the people that heard the words of Jesus and acted on them in faith. And so what's the oil in the lamp? It's either faith, it could be faith, it could be the practice of, I'm gonna suggest that it's the practice of obeying God's words, Jesus's words in faith, that practice is putting oil in your lamp. Are the religious leaders doing that? No. Do they have any oil in their lamp? No. Interesting, at the end of this, but the prudent go out, or the prudent answers, Oh, the foolish come to the prudent, right? And they say, give us some of your oil. When they realize it's not what they... And the prudent give this really weird answer. Uh, There's not enough for everybody, which seems really selfish, right? I mean, it just seems like inappropriate. But then what do they say? It says, go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. What are they actually theologically saying within the parable? You religious leaders who don't have any, haven't listened to Jesus' words and started practicing those things, you go buy your religiousness and then come back. You go pay money and buy your way into the wedding feast, right? And they do what? And they left because they thought that was a, valid option <laughs> within the parable that's that's really loud I mean that, that's like you guys actually believe you can buy your way in to this wedding feast and you will you will within this generation you will find out religious leaders you will find out that you're not prepared okay and when that time comes you won't be able to buy your way in and what does it say in the wedding uh uh, they didn't, uh, those who were ready went in and then the door was shut. Do you see that? The door was shut. You read that list last week. Um, the door was shut. In a time of judgment, the door was shut. And the people inside the door were saved and safe. And the people outside the door were taken away in judgment. Does that sound familiar at all? What other story have we heard biblically that sounds something like that where a door was shut and some people were saved inside the door and other people were taken in judgment outside. Oh, it's Noah. Well, well, that's interesting because just in the end of this last chapter, Jesus says in verse 37, he says, for the coming of the Son of Man, when Daniel 7 is really fulfilled, you'll see it on earth because it'll just be, it'll be just like the days of Noah. Uh, lots of stuff's going to be going on, people doing their regular activities. But they did not understand until the day Noah entered the ark. They didn't understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will that thing, that same type of scenario will also happen in this generation. There will be a judgment. It won't be as grand a scale as Noah's, but it will be grand in the sense that it will be a new age, the ending of an old and the beginning of a new, the destruction of the temple. Those of you might be getting caught here. Those that were in the ark were left behind. Those that were outside the ark were taken away. Those inside the ark were left behind that kind of flips it upside down with a lot of the way a lot of people read that. Right? Jesus is saying in chapter 25, it would be very similar to the days of Noah. 
there come unexpectedly this destruction that I'm talking about, the temple destruction and all, and some, some people are gonna get caught and a door will be shut. And when that door is shut, some will be caught on the outside and taken away in judgment and they will lose their lives. And some will be safe because they've heard my words, have been practicing my words, and they'll know to get out of town because that's what I've told them to do. So it's not just applicable physically, but it's also spiritually applicable. Those same people that lose their physical lives because they haven't listened to Jesus will also go to a judgment where they will be separated. That's the last part of this chapter. But before we get there, let's go to the talents. A lot of confusion on the talents. Uh, a lot of that is because of the language we speak and the way that this has been translated. So, before we get to that though, how many characters? Three. How many good characters? Two. Do we have a bad character? Yes, okay. Who's the bad character? It's gonna represent the religious leaders of the day, the temple leadership, okay? Good characters? going to represent people that have heard Jesus, believe him, uh, following his commandments, putting oil in their lamps, building their houses on the right foundation, all that, right? Okay? So, parable of talents. Unfortunate that the word talent is used here. Um, talent is a Greek word. And when Greek people say this word, it sounds just like our word, English word talent but it has nothing to do with the skill or ability that a person has. That's what it means in English. The word English word talent, that's what that means. The Greek word, unfortunately, they didn't translate this into what it means, except I think in the NIV. Does anybody have NIV? Yeah. What does it say? Gold. gold, bags of gold, I think. NIV did a great job of translating. NASB and other translations, they saw the Greek word that's pronounced talent, or close to that, and they just brought that Greek word into English as talent. Even though we already have a word that sounds just like that, that means something totally different. So that's confusing, and that's not your fault. But that's what's happening here. The NIV actually did a great job, bags of gold, because a talent is a large sum of money. We're not quite sure exactly how large, Estimates vary between one year's wages and 20 years wages. I think the cross reference on my Bible says 15 years wages. It's a lot of money. So I like the picture of a bag of gold. It's just a big old bag of gold, okay? Very valuable. So here, what we have is a parable about something very valuable. We heard something like that before. Yes. What might the thing of value be? Salvation. Salvation, the truth, the gospel truth, right? Uh, the mysteries of uh, what's going on in the spiritual realm, okay? So, if we can get past that unfortunate translational, I, I want to call it an error because it's really confusing, uh, verse 15 also confuses us a bit because it says to one he gave five bags of gold to another two bags of gold and another one he gave one bag of gold or very valuable thing each according to his own ability which that word ability almost is synonymous with our word for talents right and so just the use of the English word ability there has really even broadened the confusion we're not talking about spiritual gifts. That's how a lot of people read this. We're not talking about how the Spirit has gifted you and that you need to use those spiritual gifts. And if you don't, whatever happens to these people is going to happen to you. And if you do, you can expect bags of money. I, I don't know. No, that's not true. That's not, that's not this at all. But it is a parable about something of value being passed out to different groups of people right? At the end of which, for some people, more will be given to them, right? And for other people, even what they have will be taken away 
from them. Does that sound familiar? It should sound familiar because I'm taking you back to Matthew chapter 13, where we find the parable of the sower. And if you remember back in Matthew chapter 13, the first section of verses 19 through 23 is the telling of the parable. 18 through 20, or uh, 18 through 23 is that uh, explanation of the parable the, at the end. But in the middle, what we have is the disciples, after Jesus tells the parable, but before he explains the parable, they have this little, little interlude. You'll remember it. The disciples came and asked him, why do you speak in parables? And Jesus says, to you it has been granted. Now listen to this. The disciples are asking Jesus, why are you teaching the way you teach in parables? It's not entirely clear. And he says, to you disciples, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. You have been given something of great value. But to them, it has not been granted. Who's the them? It's the bad characters in the parable. It's the religious leaders. But to them, it has not been granted. For whoever has to him, more shall be given. Even what he, uh, but if whoever does, has not, even what he does have shall be taken away from him. What is the bag of gold? What is this valuable asset? They are, it's the knowledge of the king, uh, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That's what the talents are. That's what is being handed out. We have three characters. The bad characters are given a small amount of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. What do the religious leaders have in their possession? that do tell a little bit about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, that they have buried in the ground and not even deposited in a place where there's a little return on it, but they have buried it so deep underneath tradition that it doesn't even produce anything. What do they have? They have the Old Testament. They have the revelation of the one true God in the Old Testament, one bag of gold. Are good characters, who are they? New Testament believers that hear the words of Jesus and follow them in faith. They have been given more. Maybe you heard him in the Sermon on the Mount and you live up in Galilee and that's all you've known of Jesus. You were given two bags. Much more than just what the Old Testament says, you were given the very words of Jesus where he said, you've heard it said this in the Old Testament, but I tell you, I'll give you another bag. And you've been talking to your neighbors and your neighbors have been coming to faith and your two bags have doubled. And Jesus will say, wow, good. That's what's supposed to happen. The disciples, five bags of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. They're just three years, they're just. And Jesus is saying, you, not only now, but in the future, you will go out and you will share this with the world and you will produce again as much. And it will all be yours. It'll all be yours. This is not a God saying, I want your money, go make me money. It's a God that at the end says, to those who have, much more will be given. And to those that don't treat this valuable asset properly, even that will be taken away from them and they'll be sent away. He's talking about that generation. What would happen in that generation? Is it true of our generation? Maybe in a non-specific way, but in a very spiritual way, the exact same thing is true of us. Have we been given a talent, a bag of gold? Not just one. We've been given six. We have the Old Testament. We have everything the Gospels has given us the other five. And what's our job? This is not a competition about, you know, playing the banjo for God, uh, you know, and using your talents. This is, you've been given something of great value. And if you truly believe it, you're gonna go out. This is what Jesus is saying. You're gonna go out, and if you truly believe what you've been given is valuable, it will reproduce itself on its own because you will share it. You will live it.
you will treat people like I want them treated. Right? When did we treat you like that? I don't even know. Well, every time you did something that I told you to do to the least of these, you were doing it in this kingdom. And every time you didn't do it to the least of these, you were not. And so in 70 AD, what happened in the spiritual realm is that there was a division made. There were sheep that were identified and goats that were identified in a judgment scenario, right? Is that true of our generation too? Is that true of an end generation whenever that end, our end that we talk about is coming? Yeah, it's true. So what we find, even though these may apply just to that particular scenario, they are spiritual truths that apply to us. We can take these out the door with us and we can say, I understand my God a little bit better now. I understand my task a little bit better now as a believer, as a true believer. I need to listen to Jesus' words. I need to build my house on his foundation. I need to understand the mysteries and spread those out because they will multiply. They will multiply. That's what the gospel does. It's good news. I don't know if you heard that. It's really good news. And I'm actually going to go into the first verse of the next chapter because we find our little trigger when Jesus finished these words, which is what? The signal that our discourse has ended. And from here, like I said earlier, uh, from here we go into very familiar territory. We go into the last events of Jesus' life, his death, burial, his resurrection. And... Uh, that's what the end of Matthew will bring. Because just two days later, the son of man character will be handed over to be crucified. Let's pray. God, thanks for, uh, thanks for these two chapters. And um, I just pray that uh, you attend to us as we handle them, that you intend to our thinking and to our understanding as only you can. And to the extent that we've missed it tonight or uh, other parts of our life or in the future, I just pray that you give us grace. But to the extent that we can understand and that that understanding can then lead to a more fruitful, not only life personally, but a more fru fruitful spread of the gospel into a generation that desperately needs to hear it. So be that. In Jesus' name, amen.